We are considering the wonderful privilege we have of entering into the kingdom of God. Isn't that a lovely term when you think of it, the kingdom of God? Obviously, it means that God's got to be king, or you can't be in the kingdom of God. And uh, think of the privilege of having God as king. And when we have considered so many things of our wonderful God, we want to feel that we're inviting people to a wonderful, wonderful relationship. Let's not apologize for talking about our wonderful God. No, we are trying to think through this very important matter. As you realize, there have been various opinions on the matter of salvation. And certainly, nothing more important can be considered as we think of our responsibility of trying to bring others into this wonderful relation in which we've been brought. So we certainly must understand the way, must we not? And God wants us to have this sweet understanding. We had this uh, happy study before us on Friday that God proposes to bring us into a wonderful, happy relationship. And this is the description of salvation a deliverance from our former manner of life and a new relationship with God where we're happy and restful, where all the arguments have been settled and we're, we've committed ourselves to our precious Savior, given Him our little lives. And this is a privilege, isn't it? And here is the condition in which we were. And my, how many scriptures describe this condition? We saw that there was a process of some kind in coming from this to this. And certainly there would have to be a tremendous process, wouldn't there? Think of what Jesus said here in the 14th of Luke. You know, this is one of the passages that uh, changed my method of personal work. And this goes back about 42 years, so it's nothing new. Something that's been thought over, and prayed over, and studied over. I never did fall in with the speed method of bringing people to the Lord. I felt that it was a great change and had to have careful consideration. So I was always a little slower than, my, than many of my fellow students in their professions of winning others. But nevertheless, as I began to see from the Scripture the things we're talking about in these sessions, I saw a great new labor that had to be done. And the 14th of Luke, uh, Jesus is talking to the multitudes here. And he said in verse 26, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now remember the word disciple in the Gospels, as in the book of Acts, is the word used to describe those in reconciliation to God. And remember, the, the word hate is to love less. And by contrast, God is to have a supreme place in our life over every other single attachment. This is what salvation is. An entrance into a supremacy with God which has no competition. And we need to see that this is exactly what the Savior was saying. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Then you drop down in verse 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So there can't be any question that salvation is a supreme, absolute love for God. And this is the emergence that has to happen. Uh, we were loving ourselves, as we said so many times, and as we know so much from our own experience. And really, we weren't loving anyone else either. We were loving the way they gratified us, in some sense. And this was not virtuous love. But when we come to have the supreme attachment for God, 
We enter into a new, wonderful flow of life in our hearts. So rather than our dear ones being loved less, they're loved exceedingly greater. In fact, they are loved for the first time. So when we leave the attachments of our own selfish relations of one sort or another, and enter into this supremacy with God, here comes this flow we talked about. And this flow of love then flows out to all those around us. And so immediately they'll see a new relationship, a new kindness, a new affection, a new concern. So the net result is a multiplication of real devotion to all those in close contact with us. But indeed, there always has to be the supremacy of God. Now this is what Jesus was talking about. Now he said this is such a great change that you need to sit down and think about it. And so he gives us two examples here. And he talks about a building that's going to be built. And he says in verse 28, uh, you sit down first and count the cost, whether you have sufficient to finish it. Lest happily after he had laid the foundation is not able to finish it, all that beholds shall begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build, was not able to finish. A time element, an evaluation. So Jesus is saying, this is what has to happen. Now sit down and evaluate it. Then he talks about a king who sees the necessity of, of conquering an enemy. And he sits down first and begins to calculate his forces. He tries to evaluate the enemy forces. Or else, verse 32, while the other is a great way off, he sent us an ambassage and desired conditions of peace. And so the Lord is suggesting that this revolutionary change has to have some kind of a time of evaluation. It's not something you do quickly. It's not something you do and you don't intend to continue in it. It is, as we have said, the supreme decision of our whole life that is comparable to nothing. You remember we said there were a half a dozen major decisions in life that are so important. And none of these major decisions can be compared with our decision to be reconciled to God. Because this is total. This touches our life from beginning to end. A complete involvement with God. Let's always remember this. And let's remember we want to have love and patience in dealing with others. Because we're asking them to do the most, the most important thing in their whole life. We're not, we're not trying to sell a little product and not trying to get them to do some kind of a quick decision that doesn't involve their total personality. But it is a total, absolute involvement of everything we have. We become slaves to Jesus. We're owned by Jesus. It's a sellout, of course. And this is a privilege. And we always want to remember this. God is not privileged to get us, but he, well, we are privileged to get him. Let's always have that concept. And so we see this process of some kind that has to happen. Uh, we try to enumerate uh, some things here. This has been a very blessed study with me as I have prayed and gone over the precious word again and again and again assembling all these multitudes of passages and seeing the great desire of God as he wants to win us and bring us to himself. And I, I'm just so happy for these wonderful, sensible ABC concepts that come up from the Word. We can always have a rule of understanding, it seems to me, when we come to Bible truth. Bible truth will always be simple. Theological deductions will be complicated. And when you try to figure out how people can get to heaven in their sins, then you have complications. But if you, if you look at it like this, here God designed man to live with him. Man said he doesn't want to live with him anymore. God has made measures to recover. Man must resolve to return to God and live with God. 
Look at it this way. And things become ABC, don't they? And how there has to be this, this change of attitude, this evaluation. We give you a skeleton of the procedure, a, a process of thinking that we must go along with. We're now on page uh, two, and you have under one uh, this uh, concept. There must be a recognition of our moral relationships and responsibilities. These are fundamental, aren't they? Jesus defined and reinforced the Old Testament and said we must have a supreme love vertically if we're going to be intelligent. Because we have all this evidence of the tremendous being of God. And we must have a, a horizontal recognition of one another. Because this is a part of intelligence. And we refuse to conform to this. So the first thing we have to do is simply quit resisting what we know to be true. And we've been working at this, suppressing the truth. We've been rejecting our moral forces and these natural discoveries. We've been unwilling to conform to our concept of the great being of God that comes to us. And so we've been holding down the truth in unrighteousness. The scripture says we love darkness rather than light and haven't wanted discovery. The Holy Spirit has been trying to show us the error of our way. He's been trying to enlighten us. He's been trying to convince us. He's been uh, moving upon our conscience and our heart trying to show us that what is right and what is true. And so our conscience has been reacting with the net route result that we are without excuse. And so there simply has to be a ceasing of this resistance and the realization of what is true and that the present manner of our selfishness cannot be substantiated. In other words, here is the situation that we were living in. And we were rejecting the evidences of God. We want to be about our own business. We want to live for ourselves. And all the evidences of God are worked with and tried to suppress so they don't bother us. And conscience has been disturbing us and the Holy Spirit, remember, is always back of conscience, enlightening the mind. So conscience functions about the mind, doesn't it, we said. And so here's the situation that we find ourselves in. Now, this can never be, there can never be any kind of salvation in this manner. We have to be willing to face the facts. We have to return to what is true, do we not? And so this is the first thing we have to do. We have to be willing to have this barrier removed. So we return to truth. In other words, as soon as we open our eyes to truth, and this is the intelligent perspective over here, remember, this is the eye point looking at what is true. And we see the tremendous evidence for the being of God. Well, look what's going on in the last few days. I've been looking at some of these buds, and with interest, they're exploding, aren't they? Then all kinds of complications come out of this. Can anyone figure out how to do this, you see? If you can figure out how to do this, then you don't have to worship. But if you can't understand how, you, how to do this, there's only one thing you can do, and it's saying there's a being bigger than I am who's doing some tremendously mysterious things that I can't account for. Thus, I've got to see the great being of God and I've got to recognize him. But you see, remember we said you can't have a greater concept of God than you're willing to conform to? And so we can't have a beautiful concept of God and have ourselves way down somewhere not recognizing God. And so as soon as we open our eyes, this whole thing uh, falls to the ground. And uh, all our reasoning and our philosophies suddenly collapse. And it's wonderful how the Holy Spirit can collapse all these false ideas very quickly. And so this is the first thing we have to do. Just quit resisting our evidence, which we've been doing. We've been refusing to be conformed to this wonderful, wonderful observations that we have. Then uh, we have heard about the Bible. And uh, since the Bible is a disturbing book, if we're not willing to submit to it, we have developed false concepts about the Bible. 
Now we don't need to know very much to be saved. We spent an hour reviewing the life, teaching, and atonement of Christ. This would seem to be a description as to how God has exerted himself to reconcile us to himself. And if a person hasn't had the complications in mind concerning the Bible, we should show them these facts that are represented. And the Holy Spirit will make them real. And there can be this committal to the simple facts without a great deal of knowledge. But if I have some false ideas concerning the Bible, if there's certain things that the Bible talks about and I'm not willing to accept them, I can't have saving faith because how do I know it's true? It's, saving faith is never to try Christ to see if it works. And we said that saving faith is a drawing out toward God. There has to be a heavenly aspect to saving faith. And so we see that we cannot make this kind of a committal if we have real problems. For example, one of our YRAM groups ran into a group of scoffers in a certain place, and they were thundering away against God, and they were wise. The YWAMers just let these folks just storm away. Uh, by the hour, I guess, as I heard it. And when they get all through, then suppose well, there anything else you have to say against God? You see, if we have a restfulness of God, then we can listen to all the objections anybody wants to have. And when they just run out of them, then it's our turn to talk. Let's practice that. You see, they're very relaxed before God. They let them exhaust themselves. And the big thing they were objecting to, your Bible says God's will is being done. I don't want things the way they are. Your Bible says God does. And my, how they thunder away. When they get all exhausted in their arguments, they pointed out many of these scriptures we've been talking about. The Bible says God's will is not being done. Oh, is that so? And they get all excited. What kind of Bible teaching you call this? <laughs> so you see, they couldn't commit themselves to a God whose will they said was being done because in their own common sense, they didn't want the world as it was. Do you? Do you want the status quo at this time tonight, the way it is all over the world? Do you want every single being occupied the way he or she is? Do you want the tensions, all the struggle, all the strife? Would you want things like this if you had a choice? How could you submit to God if you believe that he is doing everything after his own will and that everything is his will that's going on right now? And so when we come to the precious Word of God, and I mentioned I found a hundred passages or more that tell me that God is a broken-hearted God. Even Jesus prayed, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This should tell us God's will isn't being done. And you can see this just pulled the rug right out from under these objections and melted them down. This is what I mean. You cannot commit yourself to, to something that you can't approve because everything God reveals is intelligent and understandable. And when people have false ideas, it's up to us to pray and have the reasons in our mind. And every time we have a time of witness, we need to have a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus said some of the most important things to one individual. So it's a very great thing to witness to one, isn't it? And we are to call upon God by faith as we talk to people because God knows the inside thoughts of everyone. And he can help us to say something that will answer their situation. So it's impossible to commit yourself to a God you question. And so it's up to us to show the lovely character of God, his wonderful reasonableness, his tender love. It's up to us to show we dwell so much upon God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all, and God is love. Therefore, everything He's ever done, He invites men to analyze Him and find fault that they can. And He knows they won't find any fault. And it's up to us to see these beautiful things from God's Word. Be very relaxed, you see, as we talk to people. Because if 
The truth doesn't make us relaxed. They're not challenged. It will help them to be relaxed, is it? And so we have to be restful with God and pray as we talk and then and feel the power of His tender love. And so people have to refuse, have to accept what's revealed. Supposing people don't want to believe in the virgin birth of Christ, for example. Well, the record says so. We have to say what the record says and show people how this might be totally reasonable, you see. Supposing someone doesn't want to believe in the deity of Christ, as we have all kinds of ideas in so-called Christian circles, don't we? All kinds of mixed-up situations. And so we have to try to simplify things and trying to point people what is revealed and pray as we do it because uh, a person must admit all the truth that he understands the Bible to reveal concerning God if salvation is going to take place now somebody's got to be responsible for sin and either God is responsible or we are responsible these are the two, only two possibilities uh, the, the clearest definition, apparently, of sin, as we've mentioned, 1 John 3, 4, sin is lawlessness, a refusal to conform to what is true and right. It's a revolt against God. And we need to develop this idea, and we have to come to the point of seeing that we are guilty of revolting against God. And we have to begin the process of eliminating our self-excuses. And my, how many dozens of self-excuses we build up in our minds. Remember, here's our key verse of this passage, which is the summation of Romans chapters 1 to 3, that all the world may become guilty before God or accountable before God or responsible before God. Romans 3.19 and no one can ever be saved except there is this acknowledgement of guilt and opening the mind to the facts. So we have to work in our excuses. This was the process of going through this cloud we talked about. We stopped down, started down here with all our confusion. And we have to end up here in the beautiful love of God. And so the Spirit works with us along the line to show us that our excuses are not substantiated. And we have to shut off one after another and emerge toward this wonderful beam of love, which is drawing us all the time, isn't it? And if it wasn't for this beam of love, I don't think we'd go through with these discoveries and all their pain, because we've reinforced ourselves with these arguments, and we've tried to ease our conscience, and, and to move out of these arguments is very painful indeed. Well, we can't blame our constitutional nature for our guilty situation. How many are doing this? It's so sad to see how so much theology works against what God is trying to do. We had this chart upon our screen before. This is the idea of many that were born with an it of some kind that causes wrong action. So you have the common statement that men are not sinners because they sin, but they sin because they're sinners. And we're supposed to be born with an entity that's sin in itself. And this entity causes action by sheer causation over the will. And my, how many times you can hear this presentation. Well, now, I wouldn't have any idea how a better excuse could be given than this. If I am born with a causation and I can't help but sin, then who in the world is ever going to show me that I'm guilty of sin? You see how theology works squarely against what the Holy Spirit is trying to do? He's trying to show the whole world guilty of sin. How can I be guilty if I can't help it? Supposing when our son is small, one of our sons, I should get a big temper up here and say, Now, son, before I come home tonight, you see that you jump over this house. You fly over this house. And I storm away and I manifest a determination to give him some terrible punishment. He'll look right square up in my face and wait till I get home and he is all ready to face me with his arguments. And when I get home and I find out he hasn't done it and I storm away at my temper, 
He looked right square in my eye. I don't know what's got into you, Dad. You don't see any equipment in my being, do you, to do what you asked me to do? And since I'm not able to do what you asked me to do, I have no guilt whatsoever in not doing what you asked me to do. And of course not. You can't have a better excuse than this. If you're not able to obey God, then how can you be guilty for not doing what you can't do? And isn't it terrifying how people try to justify eternal punishment? Isn't this a frightful thing? Here man is not supposed to do anything but sin and God threatens to send him to eternal punishment for not for continuing in sin and he can't help but sin it. What kind of a God does this make out God to be? Remember our discussion on this matter? We are to evaluate ability and guilt in proportion to the consequences. We're not to assume our own theological position and then try to see whether the consequences are right or not. It is the consequences that determine the seriousness of the event. And because God is a God of love and God of an intelligence and has pronounced these terrible consequences, there's only one answer. We are fearfully able to obey God and we have refused to and resisted the Holy Spirit all along the line. You remember our quotation of 1 Thessalonians 5.19 when you look at the verb and the command and the situation it says, do not keep on quenching the Holy Spirit. And this verb tells us exactly what we've been doing all along our life. Until we came to submit to Jesus, we were quenching, working against the Holy Spirit. He was trying to enlighten us in his love and we were resisting him and hardening our heart and fighting against him. And so this gives an entirely different picture, doesn't it? And so you come to the Scripture and see the words the Scripture uses. And we went through these words, didn't we? And we couldn't find excuses for sin. And so we saw that we are responsible. And we can't have this argument. Why, when I worked for months over these many words, as I mentioned, I had very deep tears coming into my mind. I said, my gracious Lord, here I am taught a theology of inability. And here I hear any week I want to listen to the radio, man can't help sinning. If this is right, find in the Bible where you have excuses for sin in the words that are used. Here's a challenge. And I worked for months over this question, and when I couldn't find any excuse for sin in the Bible, it broke my heart. Why should the church be tussling with this for 1,500 years, would you tell me? Isn't it sad and tragic? It is because people are looking for excuses. This is why these uh, easy-going theology ideas are perpetuated. They're so nice and comfortable. Why, if I can't help sinning, well, why blame me for doing, for doing what I can't help doing? And so there couldn't be any salvation based on this. And how many wonderful sermons we hear. And if they could only leave out a few minutes. I've heard great build-ups of very devoted speakers and the Spirit of God was working with them and the power of God was standing down over them. Then they spend a few minutes saying you can't help doing what you're doing. And they take the eraser and rub out all the good things they said and all the things the Spirit of God was trying to move upon people. And the Spirit of God has to try to climb up over these great obstacles that they've laid down to. So here's a great barrier then. The Spirit of God is trying to climb up over this barrier and get something done in spite of what was said. The message is concluded on side two. And we're sure glad he tries to do this, aren't we? But we need to work with God, not against God. And if we can't find any place in the Bible where sin is excused, we better adjust our theology. Now, we had a lot to say about depravity, didn't we? We said that depravity is not a little part of us that's in trouble, like some theological systems say. We said that depravity is what we do to our whole personality. It's a total involvement. Here's the dreadful law of habit, isn't it? But we are responsible for this situation. We said that God is so righteous and so loving that he considers our circumstances and considers our environment. But nowhere in the Bible have I ever read God commands all men everywhere to repent, provided his environment hasn't been so, so serious that it has brought him into a condition where he can't repent. 
Now, God is a God of truth, isn't He? And we can depend on everything He says and does. And so when this is another guide point of our theology. And although God does consider our environment, and if we're raised in the enlightenment of the gospel, of course, we're a thousand times more guilty than anyone who never heard of the Bible nor the truth of God. But nevertheless, all are without excuse, the Scripture says. And the Spirit is working in enlightenment all over. And uh, we can't blame God for not dealing right with us. We said they, the many scriptures point out that we are responsible for our actions. And God calls us to account, not for what Adam did, not for what we're born with, but He calls us to account for what we're doing with our equipment. If you have an automobile out here, uh, 500 horsepower under the hood, and an officer should come up to you and say, You're under arrest, sir. You look him right in the eye, and uh, why am I under arrest, you ask? You're under arrest for having an automobile with 500 horsepower under the hood. You look him right in the eye, says, Officer, your obligation is what I do with my equipment. I got a 1,000 horsepower under this hood. And if I run my car according to the law, it's none of your concern what I've got under the hood. And this represents what God evaluates us in. He evaluates what we're doing with our situation, with our equipment, with our surroundings, with our facilities. And I'm so glad of this from beginning to end. And who can object to this? And then let's remember that God is a responsible moral governor. If we bring children into the world, we are responsible for their guidance, for praying and helping them, enlightening them, overseeing them. We're responsible. God has brought us into the world as a human family, hasn't He? And so He's responsible for dispensing justice, and we know justice isn't dispensed here at all. And so who can object to this, you say? So you see, bless the Lord, we can take God's side against all accusations and do it lovingly and yet effectively. And this is what has to happen. We've seen that sin is always a wrong attitude or purpose of life, which we alone can changed by a revolutionary choice. Remember, we talked about these words, the Old Testament words and the New Testament words. And we saw this conclusion that sin is always this wrong choice. Jesus said, out of the heart is the source of sin. And that this involves our whole personality, permeates our whole being. We can't have a part of us acting and not the rest of us. So here's the situation then. And we persisted in this uh, without interruptions. And so we want to see some of the forces that help us to come to this realization. There has to be these, this realization. There has to be. God can't bring us to himself without agreeing at what's true. Remember these many passages we had? That salvation is to come to the knowledge of the truth. Remember, we have to see what God is like and how great He is. You can't have reconciliation with some kind of a concept of God in some little lowercase form of some kind. And remember, the, the selfish person has himself up here. It's me first above God. And even if you come to put ourselves below God, we still can't have a concept of salvation here, can we? The knowledge of the truth must involve a realization of the dynamic, austere greatness of God and our own little tiny smallness down here. And uh, just think of how many experiences God works with us in. He's trying to excite us now in the springtime, isn't He? He's trying to show us these many interesting things going on and trying to show us His character and so forth. Then we have uh, witnesses that we to come in contact with. And uh, we said in the earlier part of the notes about everyone who becomes a Christian has seen one somewhere. And this awakened them to thinking. Uh, think of what Paul had could say uh, as in Philippians 4, 9. How he could say that uh, what you've seen in me uh, and what I've taught you, this do. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard, and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. 
And so we are influenced by observing what the Lord Jesus has done in other lives. Then we have the Holy Spirit using the Bible as the Word of God. Here's a progression, in other words, of this matter. And uh, we begin to see certain things and we get excited about reading the Bible. And as we come to the Bible, we begin to learn certain things. And uh, we begin to ponder, why well, here's a God that wants to reason with us. We didn't realize that. We thought God was the great being who said, this is it, you do it or else. And we read the Bible, we see this isn't the case, that God's a loving God, an intelligent God. He's not asking to do anything that's not reasonable in the perfect sense. And so we're melting down. This is a procedure melting now. And we begin to see that God is not like what we thought he was. Then we start reading about the Lord Jesus and how he demonstrated what true holiness was like and how he uh, sacrificed his life in utter completion and poured out himself uh, for others. He said, I came not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. Then we see further the grief and suffering of God. Here's the melting process then. We begin to think. We begin to be moved. And we begin to think further. And then we begin to be sensitive. And we see that God has had grief over man's sin. And this has broken his heart. And so we are melting down. Here's the process then of coming through this cloud as we see it. And it is the sacred atonement of Christ as made living and real by the Holy Spirit that leads us into this experience of submission or total capitulation to his tender love. We use in our way the word togetherness. You have so many passages concerning the Lord Jesus and his sufferings. We are crucified together. In other words, the Holy Spirit that leads us step by step to realize something of the love of Christ. And we begin to relive his love and try to realize his love for us. And this is what really breaks us down before his precious presence. And so we say the cross must discover ourselves to ourselves. And we have so uh, covered up reality that we really don't know ourselves. And have to have all of this revealed to us. And when we see ourselves, then there's only one thing we can do. To take our intelligent position before God and humble ourselves down before such a great God. And look to Him for His kind mercy and tender love. Oh, I pray that this uh, section will have a great meaning to you. I have so prayed and worked over these concepts, and God has so wonderfully blessed me in this. We don't have very much time to talk about a very, very great movement that's coming into our day. You notice we give you an auxiliary sheet under this section of realization uh, called A Missing Link to Mental Health. And it, it is an emphasis of just exactly what we're talking about. Now, we have reasoned this from the Scripture. And the, the authors of this uh, procedure of thinking apparently have not gone to scriptural reasoning a point of view. But they're simply discovering something. And no doubt uh, most of them were evolutionists in their psychology. But they're simply learning by empirical methods. Now, something that is empirical is something you observe to be true without understanding why it is true. And most of these uh, psychologists think that man has just evolved, and so they don't think that man is any different, really, than the animal creation, and that he follows instincts, too. And, and you can imagine the situation that exists. But we're getting desperate in our society. Our theories aren't working. Crime is on the mad increase. And so they have gone back to the New Testament because the church uh, answered these psychological questions. You have some remarkable records how all these questions were solved and people were relaxed in God, happy in the Lord, were loving each other, rejoicing in God, and serving their fellow men. Here was the solution of psychiatry, wasn't it? And uh, so they see, look at the tensions, look at our situation these observers are making. Now look at this remarkable article. I hope you'll really digest it. It summarizes what you might have to read several books to really get the thrust out. And so they've come to the New Testament history. 
They've gone to the Bible, uh, New Testament history in the New Testament. They've also gone to the early church fathers and made a real scope of study of all the material that's available on how the early church uh, solved the psychological problems. Look down on the, the first column near the bottom. Uh, the, un the, early, the early Christians understood all this well. And they required, mind you, a deep, thoroughgoing, unreserved form of self-disclosure. Now answer in your own mind. To what extent is this now being promoted in the salvation of souls? Are Christian leaders emphasizing the necessity of a time period when we shall awake to ourselves. No, they haven't got time for this. They want to get this whole thing over in five or ten minutes, many of them. Now, this isn't logical. If I've lived for 25 years in a false deception of life, you're not going to you're not going to have a complete rethinking of your life, are you, in just a few minutes? And so we see from reality that there needs to be a change in procedure. And notice how these psychologists are going into the early church. And then after this self-disclosure, they place themselves under the judgment of the group that they have noticed. And uh, they also said there had to be an excavation of conscience. And forgiveness was not automatic. Oh my, I listened to a sermon on the radio this afternoon a little bit. Sound like salvation was so automatic and so quick to get it all over with. And indeed, this is the reason why we aren't solving people's problems. And we have the rise of the so-called Christian psychiatrist, as though, as though uh, the gospel is not the answer. Do we have to go and sit at the feet of psychological learning to answer the souls of men? I should say not. We bring our precious heart to Jesus. We beg them to stand a biblical revelation. I told you I fought this battle 48 years ago with some of my friends. And many of my friends left me. And I remained in the position I, I was raised in, that the Bible was the Word of God, and that I was to pray and study, and I would be led into the secrets of God, and I do not need to learn on the, lean on the speculations of secular writers who do not have their knees bent to the great being of God. Praise the Lord, I believe this, and I practice this, praise the Lord. And you can be sure I'm glad I have practiced it, praise the Lord. And he wants to lead us into restful secrets with his presence, bless the Lord. And I've had many thousands of camp meetings with the Lord over his precious word. And do you think we'd go back on anything like this? No, sir. Jesus said, if you come to me, you'll have all your problems solved. And people are having tensions because they've never been consumed by the tender love of Jesus and been melted down at the feet of Jesus. When you get your heart melted down, all your tensions are gone. How do you get the peace which passes understanding? By some long, grinding process of psychological help. It may cost you $100 an hour. Is this the New Testament procedure? I should say not. And you see, here's a confession of many psychiatrists that they're not solving the problems and they're getting desperate. You probably know that there's some new hospitals in the men in our country that have just as many psychologists as they do medical men because they're realizing that it's no use trying to heal the body until you get the tensions out of the spirit of people. Unless you can adjust the internal tensions, you're not going to heal the body. The body results from the tragedy of the internal tensions. As long as these tensions are not disturbed, you can work over the body all you like to, and it'll never be recovered. And they're recognizing this empirically. I get so excited about this. Praise the Lord. Here we can have the secrets of God's Word from our youth. Bless the Lord. And here are these highly educated people. They're, they're maneuvering in great research, they say, and they think they're making certain observations, and we can know the same thing from the reason and the logic of God's Word. Are you happy that you put your life on the Word of God or not? And they're getting desperate. They're, no, they're not solving people's problems. And, and notice what happened. Oh, my. 
And look at the middle paragraph, the second, the third paragraph in the middle column. They admit that there was a wonderful thing. Now, this is exactly what we said, my friend. They admit that there was a wonderful procedure. A, a, a New Testament solved people's troubles. They have to acknowledge that. They ate the meat with gladness and singles of heart, praising the Lord. They loved each other. They rejoiced in the Lord. Jesus said he was coming in, and he says, Occupy till they come. This is, this is what we're going to do, bless the Lord. We're not going to get all worked up about these material things in the old world. We're going to live for such a sweet Savior as we have. We're going to try to help each other along the way. And when we give our lives for each other, here's when we find the happiness of ourselves, isn't it so? Oh, what a sad paragraph. This powerful and effective form of psychiatry was to undergo a strange fate. In 324, Constantine has now come to the uh, dominion of the Roman Empire. And as we mentioned, he's being defeated by Christian evidence. Remember we said that when people get a hold of the Lord, they can, if they live, they live to the Lord. If they die, they die to the Lord. And Jesus has been raised from the dead, and it doesn't make any difference when he live or die. Bless the Lord, we're going to be his. And this was the early dynamic of the New Testament church, which upset the Roman Empire. You don't need to think these emperors were being moved by Christianity. They were in selfish concern. The whole thing's going to fall apart. Christianity's going to conquer us. We don't watch out. We've got to get together and have a conference here. See why we can ease these pressures that are being exerted. And so as soon as they make Christianity popular, it becomes, look at the words, don't hear it, me. Here you have the middle of this page. The church now had to be popular. Had to have a universal appeal with the result that salvation became progressively easier and less and less genuinely effective. This man's a prophet. He doesn't know it. But the Spirit of God is working behind these things, you can be sure. Then he goes on with a few history. Then you have the Reformation times. And they said that, that uh, the insane they were filled with the devil. And so they put them in dungeons and put them in prisons and, and whipped them and uh, brutalized, brutalized, treated them. But then they had an awakening here. He calls this the first psychiatric revolution. And they began to see that that you could have a collapse of mind and a collapse of mental ability, simply a wearing out of the personality. And God said, uh, dust we are, and, and uh, we are frail, and so on, and there can be these uh, things happening. So here was the first thing. Then look at the third column, we have Freud. And so he comes into our uh, circuit here, the early part of this century. And look what he said. Oh, man, we're not talking about straw men here, my friend. Are you willing to invest your life to do something for God? Do you want to be glad when you get old, if we do get old? If the Lord tarries that long. Do you want to be glad when you get old, looking back to a place where you like Paul? I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. Bless the Lord. Or do we just want to drift through life? They're following the strongest wind. Here comes Freud. He says the people had trouble because they're re repressing their instincts. And the main instincts, of course, are sex and temper. And don't restrain them or you'll damage yourself. And so you have 60 years of this business. And you wonder why we have what we have. You wouldn't believe it. I happened to look at a television by an educational station in Chicago. Here's an old man talking about what do you do with temper? He says, don't restrain it. Let your temper out or it'll damage you. Which is the biggest damage? Damage to the conscience or damage somewhere else? He's forgetting that number one damage is damage to the conscience. So here is what happened. Don't restrain these impulses. They've lost the concept of moral accountability, of course. But isn't this exciting? These speculators are face to face with man as a wonderful creature, and they can't put together his conduct upon their principles of evolution.
Man is just so wonderful he doesn't fit in with their theories. We should be excited when the Lord's side, bless God. So in desperation, they're having another revolution, which this man has been trying to work at. He's written several books. And now, look at the middle of page of Psalm 3. People get into emotional difficulties because they have been deviant and dishonest. That is out of community. And God has put within man a conscience. Now, they haven't gotten very far yet, it seems, at the main, but, but here we have group therapy. Group confession, you've read about it. And they, they discovered that if you can get out of the... the you see, Troy says, bury your, your guilt. It doesn't exist. And it doesn't work. Man's too wonderful to live like an animal. You can't bury your guilt. It'll rise up to tear you apart. And so this, the whole movement says, you've got to get it out. And it helps people. They, they made some observations. If you can get it out, find somebody that you can have confidence in and tell your guilt to some person. This lets down some of the pressure. And they find out that people are benefited and get well in many cases. So you see, isn't it remarkable? Here man is a created image of God. He's not some little animal that you can, you can play around with and maneuver his instincts. You wouldn't believe what is being said. I have so many collections along this line. It's frightening. Here's a college man in Nebraska that went out and murdered four people right in cold blood in the bank. And what do you suppose these highly educated psychiatrists said about this? Pope's grim deeds were caused by his being thrust suddenly by college graduation into an adult world with which he could not cope. And another highly educated psychiatrist said this, that something had to happen because of his own nature and pressures within him. And then she went on to say, they were the result of an accumulation of environmental stresses which he was not equipped to handle. You see the devastation. Now I'm going into all this because of your encouragement in the first place. And this is an exact verification of what we see in the Bible. And we see here man's moral responsibility. And that he can't run away from himself. And God has put within the Constitution these tremendous operations. And then we see the secular world having to face some facts and coming in our direction and having to admit that you cannot heal people in trouble by covering over their guilted conscience. And empirically, they've made a discovery that if you can let some of these internal pressures out, suddenly the body seems to be benefited. But what does this tell us, my friend? We can love and help people. Get them to come to the cross of Jesus. Open their hearts to Him. Have complete healing of their inner conscience in forgiveness and transformation. And see them delivered in their life. And free from all these tensions. And, all, and instead of being burdened down in the sin of guilt, rejoicing in the glory of God and worshiping the sacred precious Savior for reaching out and delivering us in this wonderful, wonderful way. Truly there has to be then some kind of a complete reevaluation of everything. And we're going to have this wonderful meeting with the Savior. Oh, it's so sorrowful to try to work with souls over a period of years. I've seen people have arguments with God year after year. Some of them I've seen open their minds. And, and oh, it's been so joyful to see when they open their minds. And God delivered them. Many of them got well. Many of them had the glorious joy of God restored. Others seemed to press on in their refusal. 
Isn't this intelligent, my dear friends? Jesus said the truth shall set us free. We can't be free without opening our hearts to him, can we? I'm so glad that God is not like we might deal with those who have done something against us. But he wants to forgive us and be loving and kind to us. But there's no conceivable way he can do this. Because somewhere we've got to discover ourselves to ourselves. And when we do this, then he can come in and heal us. As we have so many beautiful things to say in the next few lectures. Heavenly Father, we just worship thee tonight that we can be those little children that thou didst think about, dear Jesus, when thou wast on earth. That thou didst say that these things have so often withheld from the wise and the prudent. And thou dost want to reveal them to us. If we're willing to become small in thy sight. And we're so thankful that we can become these children in thy sight, Lord. That we can have these secrets in our minds. That many learned men are trying to brush around the outside. And try to learn some of these things partially. Lord, help us to appreciate thy word. Appreciate thy love to us. Appreciate thou the great physician. Who wants to come and heal us. Set us free. Set us at liberty. Oh, we just thank thee, Lord. There's many things that we can talk about and have these secrets from thy very heart. Amen.